Right, this starts the first chapter um, of uh, financial reporting and analysis, and it represents a great deal of uh, my current work and current interest as a scholar. What this course is is truly all about is. Um, you know, I, I'm an economist. I, I come, f I approach this a bit more as a finance person than as an accountant. And you'll see some of the differences, um, why those differences, um, why that difference will become important here. But um, for the most part, my analysis of any company as a going concern, meaning as a, as a, um, as a business is all about ignoring all the um, fluff about ignoring the contents of a you know an annual report or whatnot and really focusing on the numbers actually let's just do um, let's do an example here Um, I am doing this for the, I have not looked at this, but I'm just going to do it right now. So just to set this up as an example for this chapter, chapter one is, let's say that I want to make an investment in Nike. Now, you know, before you go on Robin Hood and just buy 20 shares because it's that easy and that's part of the problem about Robin Hood in, in my belief is that it makes investing too easy and it really shouldn't be that easy. Um, you get two kinds of people that um, make investment decisions. There are those who do a bit of a technical analysis, which means that they, you know, they look at, you know, what the trend is in the price over the past two weeks or past two months and then try to basically fit a regression line to predict the future price or conduct something a little bit more like a fundamental analysis which is a bit more of what I do which is looking at the financial statements looking at the business looking at the competitors and making an assessment based on that now if you said hey Shiting should I invest in Nike well, the basics is that you'd have to know more about the company. So let's find out more here. And again, I'm looking at this for the first time. Here's what I'll start off by saying. Don't look at the annual report. The annual report is like what you would tell your grandparents to look at about in terms of whether they're going to make a decision. Now let's look at that why. I mean, look at that. That's all like famous kind of people. Now, there's nothing wrong with famous people, but oh, I'm sorry, just looking here. Right, like reading this letter, right? This year, we brought to life our customer direct acceleration strategy. And they talk about growth areas, right? And they're going to talk about, like, all the ways in which they're a great company, right? There is profound energy for this summer of sport, highlighted by the Tokyo Olympics and Paralympics. Big deal. Um, And if we look at this annual report, right, it's going to show people loving their shoes, right? And, um, right, you can look at the board and see what kind of board members there are. Um, okay, I'm just going to scroll through this. 
you can see what their skill levels are in all these various things. You know, it's not bad information to have. But what does it tell me about the company? Not a great deal, I would argue. Right? Or then looking at things like, um, you know, how is the um, CEO compensated? Again, important. Don't. I'm not saying that it's not important. But is that really what I should be focusing on? Not necessarily. I'm going to scroll down even more here. Um, sorry, I'm just scrolling more here. You know, when you start looking at, like, footwear factories, how many are there? Are they being ethical? Um... Again, not useful, right? And then some of these annual reports then get into things like, talking about, like in this case, they could be talking about like athletes that use their shoes. That doesn't tell me anything. What I, as an investor, focus on would be within a 10K, Of looking at an income statement, what's my rev? <coughs> what's my revenue? What's my cost of sales? Looking at my balance sheet, assets, liabilities, shareholder equity. Looking at my cash flow, especially important. Looking at my shareholder equity, important. And then looking at all this, in fact, this is kind of like the syllabus for this course. So really when you think about this course, what I want you to think of it as, um, what I want you to think of it as is that you're learning how to read a financial statement that's issued by a, especially by a publicly listed firm. That's, you know, a little bit easier um, to understand. And um, there are going to be times where it's like cash flow, where the definition of cash is pretty clear, and we know exactly what we're talking about, because cash is cash. But there's going to be other things, like, for instance, accrued liabilities, to the extent that it involves warranty expenses in the future, where it's unknown. Um, that there's going to be other elements, like risk management, we're not exactly sure. So one of the things I also want you to understand about this course is that we are going to talk a lot about numbers, but the numbers themselves can be manipulated into something else. So, what you then do as an investor in looking at the balance sheet, you're looking at are they, in terms of their asset mix, do they have too much inventory? Do they have enough cash on hand? What's going on? Liabilities. You know, how are they financing their operations? What's their tax liabilities? You know, how much are they in debt versus leasing the capital that they're using? All that's important for understanding whether I, as an investor, should invest in this business. Okay. Um... So, with this learning, with this um, chapter, what we're looking at here is eh, this essentially the statement I just made, which is that financial statements 
that we get from firms, especially those that are publicly listed from their um, 8K, um, it's a valuable source of information about the company for us, especially as investors, potential investors who are not in that firm. It helps reduce the amount of information asymmetry. Then we talk about what is that information used for? Well, one of the things it can be used for, again, is making an investment decision, but it can also be used by managers within that firm to manage the corporation as a whole and to manage its different divisions. Now, much of these numbers that are being generated are being guided by um, accounting rules and accounting standards. So we're going to talk a little bit about what those standards and rules are. Keeping in mind, I'm not an accountant. And then we'll kind of talk about some of the new trends like sustainability, governance, things that, eh, yeah, it's important, but, you know, it's important for some investors to think about those things, but it's not necessarily the case that all investors care about those things. And I can't agree anymore with what's on slide three here. How can you buy or sell a stock without having looked at the financial statement? Like, how would you, if you're doing that, and you know who you are, if you're doing that because you're buying GameStop because, you know, you're just, you're shorting it, you are setting yourself up for disaster. At least that's what this course is going to demonstrate to you, that you're setting yourself up for disaster. Because I would argue you know nothing about the company. You are gambling. Right? Gambling, unfortunately, also can have some strategy, though, as well. This is just like, you know, going to the video machine thing and just, like, pressing down the lever. And, you know, luck is determining everything. And so if you're investing in GameStop... You're largely relying on luck, unless you are one of the rare individuals that's reading the financial statements, which I doubt you are. The financial statement truly is the easiest. What's nice about financial statements is that they're just they're they're universal. They're transparent to a large extent about what's going on in the company. Now, as I had said, accounting is going to tell us well about things like, for instance, cash, but warranties, it's not going to be as good at um, measuring. So, it is important to... Um, realize that there can be limitations to data as well. Um, and that even accountants sometimes get it wrong. As they did most recently with like WeWork, where they used this um, community-adjusted EBITDA, which is pretty controversial. Um, and somehow their accountants, Ernst & Young, let it go. And um, the the beauty of the financial statement in that case is that you know there's all this hype about we we work, which is this company that basically rent out offices to individuals. And there's all this hype. It looks cool, and then people are like, "Oh yeah, I'm gonna buy the stock of the company." But really, until you look at the um, financial statement, would you be able to realize how dangerous an investment in that company would have been? And it almost went public before it failed um, in September of um, 2020.
Um, as pointed out already, these financial statements, they do tell us a lot. They do um, remove some of the asymmetry, information asymmetry that exists between those within the firm and those outside the firm. Um, those financial statements as well can be used by banks if this company wants to borrow money. Um, it can be used by public officials that want to determine whether a company can expand its business and do it in a sustainable way. But for all of this information, you have to balance things because you can collect a lot of data, but it's going to get more and more costly to do it. And so companies also then need to assess, is it worth it for me to release this information? Some of it doesn't have to be released. It's just that companies choose to. There is, however, some basic information that any publicly listed firm must submit. And for the most part in this course, we're going to be focusing on the top two and the bottom um, in terms of users of financial statements. Most of the time, we'll probably be talking about this from the shareholder and investor perspective. Then we would look at it from in terms of managers trying to manage their business um, using this um, accounting information, financial information. And then the final part would be the government, because the government's always involved in some way. And in this case, it would be in terms of taxing um, what's being done. Okay, um, I'm going to stop the video here. Um, there's a limit on time that the video can record, and then I'll just be merging them after. Okay, let's continue this. So, in terms of the information that is um, revealed, again, there's some basic information that any publicly listed firm needs to list. And this is guided to us um, by the Financial um, Standards Board, um, the um, Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, they're going to tell us what you absolutely have to reveal. And then companies don't want to just do the bare minimum. Um, because if you do the bare minimum, that's going to make investors, potential investors, start to question um, what's going on. Only if you're a really big company can you kind of say, eh, I don't want to reveal that. So one example is that Amazon doesn't really tell us a great deal about, or at least they used to not tell us a great deal about how much revenue they were getting from um, their their ownership of um, Amazon um, Cloud, Amazon Web Services, AWS, which is actually generating most of the profit um, for that organization. Um, or, for Apple, we never had a very clear idea about, um, you know, sales of specific product lines. So at some point, firms have to then decide what are they going to disclose versus what are they going to keep within the firm, to some extent for some numbers. Um, the Securities and Exchange Commission does have a um, um, regulation for fair disclosure. And what it does is it makes sure that even small-time investors have the, um, bas the same basic information at the same time as more experienced investors. Um, and what it then does is it stops companies from perhaps telling professional investors more or earlier or in like a more intimate situation than they tell regular investors um, just to kind of again level the playing field 
Um, everyone gets the information at the same time. So think about that. Financial statements are really democratic. Democratic in this is with small d, right? In terms of everyone gets the same information at the same time. Now, those who look at financial statements, um, lots of different individuals look at these. Primarily, though, from our perspective in this course, um, we're primarily going to be looking at this in terms of being um, equity investors. As opposed to if you're an accountant um, and you take the other section of this course, um, you're probably going to be looking at a little bit more like independent auditors slash accountants. Um, in this section of the course, we're looking at a little bit more from the equity investors standpoint. Um, the principles, the accounting principles that guide um, everything being done here are the generally accepted accounting principles or GAAP. Um, everything that it takes to be an accountant does involve some level of judgment about how do you measure things. Again, when I just critiqued Ernst & Young's accountants about how they let WeWork get away with this community-adjusted EBITDA, dude, no such number exists as far as I'm concerned, and as an investor, I'd really dislike it. But that was a judgment made on the part of Ernst & Young to make we work happy, I'm presuming. Now, financial statements are useful as well because they can help us predict what the future is going to look like. So, when we say that, it's going to help uh, managers within the firm make better decisions and know where points of weaknesses potentially are within the firm. You do not want to see any false or misleading information in the financial statement. I would go so far as to say, unless you have a longer history of doing the right thing, Any substantial error in your financial statement puts the entire company in peril. Now, we know certainly some where the financial information was very much incorrect, like Enron, like WorldCom, where these firms, or even WeWork, I would argue, where these firms largely failed to be um, transparent in their financial statement and markets slash investors basically disregarded the companies. And then in terms of these qualitative characteristics of these generally accepted accounting principles, the GAAP principles that are then being deployed, it all goes back to comparability, verifiability, timeliness, and understandability. You know, how can we compare firms in the same industry? How can we compare their financial statements? Is everything that's being um, revealed to us in a financial statement, is it verifiable? in some way. And how old is the data? Right? Is it timely? Um, and what does it tell us? What does that data point tell us about the company? Really, truly? Right? If I'm measuring how much trash gets taken out of my firm every day, every week, every month, that information better tell me something. And better not just tell me how much am I recycling versus not recycling. Rather, I'd have to make some sort of argument that 
you know, it's it can be predictive of the company doing very well or not very well to the extent that it's generating more trash. Um, within the United States, the generally accepted accounting principles, again, are coming from the FASB, the SEC, um, and to a smaller extent by the PCAOB. Um, in other countries, what's interesting is that it's actually codified into into law. Um, and those are all those are all in, in, um, invented by the um, IASB, the um, International Economic Standards Board. So there's a politics. There's a politics to, to it all. In fact, that was the nature of the very last accounting course I took um, at Notre Dame, um, where we were looking at um, ethics in accounting and looking at some of the um, thing, the, the influences that are determining the standards. As it says in this slide 16, um, the setting of generally accepted accounting principles is a technical and political process where every group is trying to push a certain way of measuring things and what that information tells us. We do have from the FASB um, a transition of all the GAAP literature into what's called the Accounting Standards Codification, the ASC. And what's nice is that that organization actually then resolves disputes about data that's being revealed. Um, it tries to measure, you wouldn't want to just start collecting data, you'd want to think about what am I trying to prove? What's my hypothesis? about what's going on here. Then you deploy the something that's going to reduce the humidity so that, you know, um, you're going to do something that reduces the, um, you know, the humidity. Uh, what am I trying to say? You want, you want to, want to do something that reduces um, any of the uncertainty. So, you know, what I'm trying to say here is that when you've got something like a um, um, a standard, right, of, so, so something like humidity, right, where I can measure it, and at a certain degree, it then becomes too humid or it's not. That's what this FASB with accounting standards codification can do for us. It can tell us whether something is true or not and it can try to reduce some of the uncertainty that exists. Those accounting standards are then, um, those 90 topics are then organized into four areas. Those four areas are then put into um, subdivisions then you're going to have um, sections, and then you're going to have subsections. So it really is a top-down matter where things get organized. Topics, subtopics, sections, subsections, and paragraphs. What's nice about those accounting standards, about those accounting principles, is that it does give us a, um, a way to get some flexibility as well considering the circumstances. So you will get some ability to, to use estimates, to use judgments, to get things through, which was, again, that whole nature of we work using that community-adjusted EBITDA. 
not what I would do. Um, managers, unfortunately, can um, misuse that um, flexibility to pursue um, their own interests at the expense of investors. Okay, to continue on here. Um, the There's been this push, and I've kind of talked, I alluded to it earlier. There's been this push for, you know, things about like climate change and governance and things like that. Um, and, and, and as um, someone who does financial analysis, we call it ESG, um, environmental, um, sustainable governance, um, societal governance. Um, ESG standards are um, environmental, social, and um, corporate governance. Um, you know, how conscientious is the firm towards these um, goals? Um FASB and the SEC don't require these things. Some individual organizations, again, like the CFA, um, do require these things. I'm just, you know, coming from my own personal perspective, um, my purpose for investing in a company never has anything to do with what their social um, stances on different things. I'm not going to buy a company based on its lack of a conscious, nor will I buy it because it has, it thinks it is superior to other firms uh, in their conscience. You know, firms if they do their job well, make money. And um, how, how, um, how, what is the ability of that company to generate the revenue that's going to generate the profit? Um, how sustainable is it in terms of maintaining those profit levels? Um, that's what should be important to an investor, not whether it um, reduces its carbon footprint, in my opinion. That certainly, I'm not the only one who thinks that, um, but there are also other things that some investors care about. Like, they do care about climate change, and they will invest accordingly. Um, but then you're investing for, it, obviously, a very different reason. Okay, um... Professional life of an analyst is more difficult. Um, I'm not sure what that really needs from me. Um, what this slide is kind of pointing out here, which I think is somewhat useful here, is that because different accounting standards are being used in these three companies, Ford, Fiat, and Honda, um, we can't really compare what's going on because because of the different accounting standards um, that these are not comparable um, which then makes it difficult for an investor if they want to invest internationally like how do we understand um, these numbers and what they mean if you want that exposure you can do it in two ways um, you can buy what's called an ADR, um, which would be a, basically a foreign company that's then subjected to um, U.S. accounting standards so that it can be understood by an American investor. Um, or, alternatively, um, let's say you're buying an international stock fund. International stock funds sometimes actually just have U.S. companies that do a lot of their operations internationally. Okay. Um, I don't want to t 
talk about things that I know less about. Again, keep in mind I'm not a accountant, so I apologize already. But as an investor and as a finance person, um, when I look at things like the IAS, uh, the IASB, um, the goals of the IA, the IASB, and how those standards um, for the um, IFRS, how those differ from the um, GAAP approach, um, it does muddy the situation a little bit more because you do have different standards. Um, it's one of the big reasons why I, as an investor, don't do a lot of international investing. I just don't understand all that's going on. And it's primarily because of the financial statements being different. Now, when I was taking that ethics and accounting course in the early 2000s, um, the big push has been to... To, to merge some of these standards, but um, as the as is bolded in slide 27 here, probably not going to happen anytime soon. Um, and that's just because um, um, the companies where they're headquartered, um, those countries are likely to keep their standards as they are. Okay, I'm assuming you can read um, the conclusion, you don't need me to read that um, for you, and neither do you re need me to read for you um, the appendix. Okay, so I'm going to stop the slides, but I'm going to make one, I'm going to talk for just one little bit more um, about a couple. Okay, just to talk about, um, so now the slides are done, but just to talk about um, a little bit more about what we're going to be doing this entire semester. Um, one of the sites we're going to be using a lot is um, Koifin, um, K-O-Y-F-I-N. Um, and the reason why is because even though we don't have um, terminals on this campus, like Bloomberg terminals, um, which are great for getting um, financial information, um, let's go back to my good friend Nike here. Um, how do I understand, you know, what's going on in that firm um, for Nike? If I click on financial analysis here, look what I can get here in one easy database sense here. For Nike, if you said shiting, should I invest in Nike? Again, I'm not going to be like, dude, doesn't, uh, you know, name your favorite um, um, you know, athlete and whether they use Nike or Adidas or what do they use? Um, I don't, that's not what I should be using as an assessment of whether I should be investing in Nike or not. Instead, under the financial analysis here, Let's start to look at the trends. And again, the point of this course is that, yes, you, some, many of you are accountants, and so you have some notion of how these numbers are generated. But what we need in the financial analysis is the assessment, the judgment of what is that telling us. And one of the things that we could see here is that in um, in 2021 there has um, you know been some some troubles um, in terms of the um, the earnings and why that's the case may there might be a number of reasons of why that's the case let's try to get a sense of why that's the case well part of it looks like it's because it's just um you 
No, that's actually... Hmm. It's actually looking... pretty strong. Yeah, by Nike. We'll talk about why that's the case. I'm just looking at this data here. And again, I, I'm just, I'm not obviously in this video talking about what these numbers mean. What I'm trying to do is build some sort of excitement here about the richness of the information that we have available. But also about what we're going to be doing this semester is, is that we will be understanding these things um, a little bit more. Okay.